say thank you for taking the time to come out uh, uh, here tonight to, to hear. I think it will be a terrific uh, uh, presentation. And let me turn the floor over to our friend uh, uh, Miles from uh, from Demos. They have a rich history in, uh, uh, in these issues uh, based in New York. And uh, he'll tell you a bit about their organization. And uh, I thank him for uh, his partnership with us here tonight. Thank you all very much. Miles. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right. I just, uh, my name is Miles Rappaport, and I'm the president of Demos. And uh, before you get into the meat of the program tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about the organization. First, I want to uh, really thank Mass Inc. for not just for sponsoring uh, Camera Drought and the, and the book and working here with Demos, but for collecting such a really uh, a terrific audience tonight of people who I think will uh, gain something significant from, uh, from Camera's discussion. Uh, Demos is a five-year, Demos is Greek for people the root word of democracy. Uh, we are a five-year-old policy, research, and advocacy center based in New York, um, or something called the Think and Action Tank. Uh, we have taken on three of what we think are some of the most important issues facing people in this country. One is to make our democracy work in as inclusive and as vibrant and as a participatory way as possible. We have, unfortunately, in our country, a democracy that is... Uh, uh, shrunken, distorted, and bleached uh, in terms of the participation of people in it. And I think those of us who really care about our democracy need to do it. We are very fortunate to be working very closely in Boston with the National Voting Rights Institute, whose director, Stuart Comstock Gate, is here. If you haven't uh, familiarized yourself with NBRI, you should. They're a fabulous uh, litigation uh, outfit on democracy issues. The second issue that uh, we're, and one of the things that we think is our responsibility is the most, but I think in some ways all of our responsibilities, is to do a little challenging of the reigning assumptions on some of these issues. I think the reigning assumption on democracy is that, you know, we had a few problems maybe in the election of 2000, but otherwise America is a fabulous democracy and we ought to be making sure that countries around the world emulate us. I think we ought to do that, but we also ought to make sure that our democracy is working at home. We got a lot of homework to do on this issue. Uh, we'd love to do it with you. The second issue where the reigning assumption I think is really unhealthy is that we've had over the last 20 or 30 years a real attack on kind of the notion of community and the idea that the public sector or government as the representative of all of us can do something good. Everything has become privatized. Uh, problems have become privatized. Solutions have become privatized or marketized. And I think we need to uh, challenge that and say that one of the things that we need to do in this country preserve those public structures that we have, whether it's levees in New Orleans or roads and bridges here in Massachusetts or the Federal Deposit Insurance Company or, or kinds of things that people get when they uh, fall into trouble. We ought to preserve those public structures and not allow them to fall into, into disrepair and not uh, sort of fall prey to the notion that the government can't do anything right and so let's just leave all the problems aside. The third area where Demos works and where I think probably more than anything else the rating assumptions need to be challenged about our economy. We have to have an economy that works for everybody, uh, young people, uh, retirees, uh, people who are in need of, uh, of support in, in one way or another. Um, and we don't have that now. We have a, a, an economy where the greatest achievement of my parents' generation, the greatest generation, they call it, is the creation after World War II of a genuine, strong, solid middle class in the United States. It was the envy of the world. That middle class, as some of you may be uh, experiencing or understanding from your own experience, is in danger of eroding. It's harder and harder for people to get into it, young people. I think you'll hear Pamela talk about that. It's easier for people to fall out of it. Uh, many people are one injury or one job loss away from, uh, from real economic insecurity, and we need to change that. So uh, we have greater and greater inequality in this country, and I think we need to change that. So what Demos tries to do is put out a body of ideas, policies, research, publications, materials, our website, by the way, is uh, easy to find. We're www.themos.org. Uh, I encourage you to go and, and find it. But I think one of the things that the, one of the areas of work that is most important to us is the notion of making sure, I say this as a, as a middle-aged person, that your generation, the next generation, has as good a chance to succeed and as good a chance to achieve uh, the pursuit of happiness as my generation did. And I think that is at risk right now. And so... Uh, we are really, really proud of, uh, of STRAP, uh, the book that Cameron has written. We're delighted that uh, Mass Inc. is allowing Demos and, uh, and Cameron to talk about it tonight. I think you'll learn something from it. I look forward to the conversation. 
and uh, I'm really excited that John Schneider is going to do the uh, honors of uh, talking with Tamara. So good Thank luck you. to both of you. <laughs> Tamara has been, by the way, uh, for four and a half years, the director of the economic program, economic opportunity program at DEMOS. She has built a real program that on debt issues, on inequality issues, has added something to the public debate. I think she's one of the most important voices for the future of our country. Pay close attention. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miles. Well, good evening and, and welcome. I'm John Schneider, I'm Vice President of Mass Inc. Uh, and what a terrific turnout we have tonight for this uh, topic and, and our discussion. I'm really looking forward to facilitating tonight's uh, discussion. This is an interesting book, uh, and it's raised some important issues, issues that have special relevance uh, in a high-cost state like Massachusetts, uh, where it's even more difficult for young professional and working families uh, to settle down and start a family. And I also think that there's some generational issues here that I hope we can explore tonight. What re uh, responsibility does one generation have to the next? So I hope we can get into those issues and what we can do to make the middle class uh, more accessible and sustainable to 20 and 30 year olds here in Massachusetts and across the nation. Our format tonight is pretty straightforward. In a moment, I'll introduce you to Tamara Drought, and we'll talk a bit about her book, and we'll take your questions as well, uh, but not at the end of the program. We're going to take your questions throughout the conversation with Tammy, so just think of this as kind of a, a talk show program, and we're going to bring you in. Now, we do have some handheld microphones. I think the acoustics in this room are pretty good, so you know if you can speak, speak loud, uh, we'll dispense with moving the microphone. Uh, around, unless that's going to be an issue for our, it is going to be an issue for our folks recording it. Okay, so we are going to ask you to use a, a hand, have handheld mic. Uh, at around 8 o'clock, uh, we're going to move into the lobby for a reception, uh, and of course, Tammy will be available to sign uh, her book. I want to also want all of you to know that this program uh, is being recorded for the WGBH Forum Network and can be accessed online and download it as a podcast at www.wgbh.org backslash forum. So we'll have some information about when that's going to be available. Tamara Drought is director of the Economic Opportunity uh, Program at DEMOS, a national think tank headquartered in New York. Her research and writing have appeared in major newspapers, and she has appeared and is appearing uh, on numerous TV and radio programs although I don't think she's been on the John Stewart show yet. Her full bio is in your program, and it's nice to have you back with us again at Real Talk. You were a panelist at our second Real Talk program on housing and home buying here in Massachusetts, and at that time you mentioned that you were writing this book and decided we wanted to get you uh, back here uh, as part of your uh, uh, book release. Uh, I wish I could tell you that it's gotten easier to buy a house here in Massachusetts, but that's not the case. Uh, the, Tammy, it seems to me that the key theme underlying your book is that for many professional and working adults in their 20s and 30s, it's harder and harder to live the American dream. Why do you think it's so hard for young people to get into the middle class these days? That's a good question. Um, is my mic on? Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think the easiest way to explain what's happening to young people is to think about um, it as an obstacle course, that uh, going from being in school to a full-fledged uh, independent adult is like an obstacle course. And each step along the way are some hurdles from getting an education, getting a house, starting a family, finding and keeping a job. Those are all the hurdles, and I address them all in the book. But what's happened is that each of those hurdles, there's been – a shift in public policy and the economy that have resulted in those hurdles being full of a lot more jagged edges than they were a generation ago. The obstacle course now has, you could think of it like uh, whiplash turns. Um, and at, at every hurdle, there have been decisions that have been made that are impacting young people's ability to get through the obstacle course and their ability to either work or educate their way into the middle class. Well, you make an argument also in your book, though, that there are, uh, there are now more risks uh, in our society, uh, that we now are more responsible for things like financing our education, 
taking care of health care, taking care of retirement. But, you know, I'm just curious. I mean, isn't that what we wanted? Didn't we want more choices? And why are 20 and 30 year olds more affected by this than, say, uh, boomers or retirees? Well, I think uh, this age group has the unfortunate um, luck of being born um, and coming of age during a, a period in the United States when um, we really were shifting away from the idea of collective and social responsibility to this notion of everybody for themselves, individual responsibility, not only in terms of public policy, but in terms of the way we think about the economy and the market. Um, you know, the period of the 80s and 90s has been this, this free market ideology that the, leaving the market to do its magic would create a more robust democracy. It would make us all wealthier and give us more job opportunities. Um, and I think what we're finding is that as a result of that sort of cultural and ideological and political shift, um, basically we've transferred the burden from all of us in this room collectively to each one of you individually. And as a result, we are now seeing what's happening. Young people are graduating college with $20,000 in student loan debt on average. I think even more disturbingly, 70% of us aren't getting uh, college degrees of any kind. So I think this is a real, it's indicative of a shift that I don't think a lot of people understand. And we unfortunately have the bad luck of, of coming of age at sort of the pinnacle of this era of personal responsibility and devolution from social to the individual. I mean, isn't there widespread economic uncertainty for all of us? I mean, look at what happened last week uh, with the closing of uh, a number of Ford Motor plants and the loss of 30,000 jobs. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to look at young adults, one, um, because I think that their economic circumstances are often um, much more uh, misunderstood than what's happening to other age groups. This is the iPod question that she's been getting, right? Right. You know, shouldn't young, young people would be fine if they just stopped buying the $5 lattes at Starbucks and didn't have the iPods and the designer clothes. Um, and you're laughing, but I get asked that question all the time. Um, my book isn't about saying that other people don't have it hard. My book is about this is such an a important stage of life. This is when all the major decisions about the rest of life unfold. Where you're going to school, how much college you're going to get, what you're going to do to earn a living, where you're going to live and raise your kids, when you're going to have children. And by sort of zeroing in on that, I think it's a real way to see how good of a job our society is doing and sort of creating the environment where people can actually fulfill their potential. Um, it, it's a way to look at how are we, are we making good on the promise of the American dream that, you know, if you work hard and play by the rules, you'll, you'll get ahead and uh, be able to live in a safe neighborhood with good public schools and be able to have a job that, that pays you more increasingly every year, um, those types of things. So that's why I wanted to look at young people. I mean, one of the things you talk about in, in your book is, is that, you know, young people are uh, living, you know, now paycheck to, to paycheck. Um, but I was kind of looking back, uh, you know, when I just got out of college. I mean, haven't we, haven't young people always sort of lived paycheck to paycheck just starting out? Isn't that right. sort of part of the deal that when you start off, if you're going to struggle a bit? Absolutely. And, um, I, you know, the struggle to get ahead, you know, the, the paycheck to paycheck, I think that's always been part of becoming an adult. But I think what we're seeing is a real difference in sort of, you know, we're not actually living paycheck to paycheck. We're living paycheck to paycheck in the minuses and the minuses and the minuses because we're weighed down by debt from the very beginning. Um, compared to previous generations, you know, Two-thirds of a worker's wage growth happens during the first 10 years in the labor market after, after college. There's been studies done that show that this generation's earnings aren't growing nearly as quickly during those formative years in the labor market as they did for the previous generation. And I think also the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that if you compare what the typical 25 to 34-year-old is earning today, they're earning, if they're a college grad, they're earning about the same in inflation-adjusted dollars as they did three decades ago. Now, keep that in mind. No progress in terms of wages in three decades. But think of everything that costs so much more and have grown, the costs have grown so much faster than inflation. 
college for one. Housing, I don't, you don't need me to tell you that high housing has gotten sort of um, gone through the roof, no pun intended. Um, Health care. And then we have the, the reality that today's young families need child care and they need more access to supports than perhaps previous generations. So I forget the question you the asked The question was me. paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> Haven't we always lived paycheck to paycheck? So yes, in, we have, but this is a new type of paycheck to paycheck because they're not, we're, we can no longer expect that today's young people are going to age out of this economic circumstance they're in. And in fact, so that's the, the difference. The difference that's is the difference. Okay, that, it, yes, paycheck to paycheck, but uh, the difference is right. that's going to go on for a longer period of time. And paycheck with a debt with burden. The, talk a little bit about the debt issue because you really take on in a way that uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't really seen um, the, the credit card companies. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, get into a discussion about um, their the deregulation, uh, and uh, uh, the havoc that they're also uh, playing in terms of uh, family finances and individual finances. Okay. You know, what's so uh, bad about the credit card companies? Oh. It's one of your favorite topics, right? <laughs> yeah. So Please. it starts in college with a free T-shirt, right? Yeah, it does start in college with a free T-shirt. Um, the credit card industry, for those of you who don't know, is um, <laughs> you know the you all know industry. the credit card industry. I How many you know. here have a credit card? All right, how many have two credit cards? Okay, three, four. We won't ask how many of you have debt, but I, I bet a lot We're going to get to that, though. Um, here's the thing about the credit card industry. About uh, three decades ago, I won't bore you with the details, basically it was deregulated in terms of pricing and marketing and all of that stuff uh, through some Supreme Court um, rules. So today what you have is a runaway industry where they, and this is, open the next offer you get, um, and you'll see this in small type but bold. We reserve the right to change the terms of your account, including the APRs, at any time for any reason. And APR means? Annual percentage rate. Right. Okay. <laughs> you almost got me. Um, uh, which is not really much of a card member agreement in terms of a contract being, you know, negotiated between two people. Um, and so what happens is young people, one, I often talk about how debt begets more debt. If you're entering real life with twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in student loan debt, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to be relying on credit cards more than somebody who does not have that student loan debt because that's $200, $300 of your monthly paycheck, which means... You're not building an uh, emergency fund, so when the car breaks down, Visa and MasterCard are the only way that, that you're going to be able to repair it. You'll probably build a professional wardrobe with credit. The nasty thing is, is this generation relies on credit um, for a lot of, I think, <coughs> real economic reasons, not a lot of the spring break and, and designer clothes and Starbucks. Um, but once you're sort of in the debt trap, the, because the market is so deregulated, you can go from 9% to 29% in a minute. You know, that payment lands at the post off box at 2.01 instead of 2 p.m., and you're now all of a sudden paying 29, 30% on a loan, which basically means it's going to be much, much more difficult for people to get out of debt. And indeed, that's what's happening. This debt is really sticking around. And that begins in college, uh, yeah. credit card companies in college. Well, there's, has, it, has any uh, state actually regulated that? Um, yep. I know, I don't think that's in Ma here in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but so there are states that have regulated the access uh, credit card companies have to college students. Yeah, on, on uh, public college campuses, they've, they've made it more difficult. Um, but in most states, you know, this is where the big public universities really play a big role because... If you pull into any big public university, I mean, MBNA, Bank of America, Citibank, that is the new welcome wagon for college students. And not only that, but the schools are often in collusion with the industry. There's all sorts of deals where the school gets um, millions of dollars for uh, if they allow, let's say, just one credit card company to solicit on campus. Um, th that was an agreement that happened between, I think, First USA, which is now some other bank, and um, one of the big uh, universities in the South. Um, they sell students' names and addresses to the credit card companies. Um, and the, 
the universities have a real, this is a real profit center for them often, um, a new way to build a new fitness center and a new stadium and things like that. But if you pay your bill on time, you're not going to have any problems. She's giving me this look. Um, other than hopefully you're making more than the minimum payment and actually putting a dent on the principal. I want to shift gears for a moment and talk a bit about what you call the debt for the diploma system, um, uh, which is, I think, one of the most significant differences between uh, when I graduated from college uh, from a private school just down the street in 1980 and today, and that's the huge debt burden that students are carrying. Um, how do you explain that? What's, what's different? What's happened? So that more of that debt responsibility, right. more of that responsibility for financing a college education has been shifted to students. Yeah, it's a good question. A couple things. Um, at the federal level, um, financial aid, without any public debate, really, has just steadily since the 1980s shifted away from providing grants to students to help them pay for college, which don't have to be repaid, to uh, providing loans, which have to be paid and often with interest. Um, in fact, the ratio of grants to loans has just completely flip-flopped in two decades. Um, the other thing is the grant aid has not been um, increased to keep up with the rising cost of college or the fact that there's a lot more students today than there were three decades ago. So let me give you an example. The most common grant, the Pell Grant, which helps uh, kids from low and, and moderate income households afford college back in the late 1970s, would cover about three quarters of the cost of going to college. Today it covers about a quarter, if that. I mean, we've just seen a real plummet in the purchasing power of grants. Um, the other thing that's happened is states have sort of dropped the ball as well. Because states provide the, the bulk of operating support for colleges. That's how colleges get, public colleges get, um, state colleges get their, the bulk of their, their revenues. So what has happened in the 1980s is that states have, have steadily been declining in terms of the percent of their revenues that they're spending on higher ed. In turn, colleges are raising tuition to make up the difference. So those two things, three things really, rising enrollments, decline in, in federal financial aid, and the lack of a, a stable, serious commitment from the states to invest in higher education have resulted in um, what I call the debt for diploma system. We're going to take a question from the audience in, if, in, a, in just a second. So if there is a question, uh, Emily has a handheld microphone, and uh, we can get her attention. But I want to um, ask uh, another couple of questions in terms of the of the college issue because, you know, I do think it is. I mean, it's kind of interesting that um, we have uh, higher and higher price. College is more expensive. There's more debt, uh, but there's also a new challenge now, and it's not just going to college. You argue it's going to the right college, and that's also impacting um, young people as well. How's that impacting um, the decisions they make, and then the the debt that they have to carry after they graduate? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, one of the things that has happened is, you know, as a bachelor's degree has basically become the new high school diploma in terms of it is the bare minimum requirement for getting into the middle class, there's a lot more competition for bachelor's degrees. Everybody wants one. Everybody is told they need one. As a result of that, the, 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 any margin of benefit that you can get up on, on your colleague, you know, your peers, is that much more important, which makes going to an Ivy much more important than going to the, the state college. Um, and as we've seen, as we've disinvested in the federal financial aid system and we've slashed grant aid, the, the difference in who is attending elite select universities and who is going to state colleges has just grown. Um, at this point, the, the bulk of the students on... Um, private select universities are from upper income families. It's shocking the lack of, there's actually now, and this is a good thing, there's more racial diversity on America's select uh, universities and much less class diversity than um, we used to have. Do we have a question? We have a question yet from the audience, anybody? Yes, we have one up here. Hang on for one second. Let's get you a microphone. And if you could just uh, introduce yourself too, just tell us your name, that'd be great. Sure, Lisa. But if you could stand up as well, that would be helpful. I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's just. Not a problem. Lisa from Framingham. 
That's right. Lisa's a regular Real Talk attendee, too. Good for you. Sure. My question is on sort of creative working. At what point can you sort of take on some interesting sort of jobs, either doing mall surveys, um, doing online surveys, and you can get the money but not have to pay taxes on it? So that at least can help you. So how can you kind of get a little business going on the side to supplement uh, uh, your, uh, your current job and not worry about paying taxes? Paying taxes. I shouldn't say this. I'm going to get in trouble, but you're not going to run for office, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Good. I mean, one of the things, though, Lisa brings up is, you, you, you know, many, many um, young um, professionals still need two jobs, at yeah, least. Absolutely. And certainly families have to have two incomes working. Yep. Yep. I mean, there's this, this strain. You need two paychecks. Yep. You need a part-time job uh, you, in order to... Uh, to, to uh, balance things off, to, to, to pay the bills. You're seeing more of that kind of thing? Absolutely. In fact, um, this age group, 18 to 34-year-olds, compared to previous uh, generations and, and older folks, have, uh, are much more likely to be holding down more than one job. And I talk to a lot of young professionals who are working um, in their chosen field and then either waiting tables at night or working at retail I myself worked at Baby Gap for a while when I first got started. Um, good times. I worked at Sport Mart in Chicago. Yeah? Yeah. It's, yeah, so, it's good fun. Good times. Good. We're going to go to another question for a second. Is there, any, is there another question from the audience? Do we have somebody else? Yes, we have one back here. Hi, Darren Schaefer, also from Birmingham. Um, how does this generation differ not from the boomers and – not from the greatest generation, but the generation that grew up and was of this age during the Depression? Oh, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> that's For a example, really good question. Uh, I, my grandfather told me stories that they grew up in a triple-decker. You had the grandparents in one level, the right. parents in another level, right. et cetera. Right. And Your grandfather walked to school uphill both ways, right? <laughs> no, it was downhill one way, okay. and the o he had to swim across the ocean. <laughs> That's a good question, and I'm not going to answer it to fully because that's just not my area of expertise. My book really compares uh, our generation to our parents' generation, so it really is a baby boomer to Gen X and, and a little bit of Gen Y comparison. But I think you actually hit on one of the big differences, which is um, we are, we're, we've just become completely sort of atomized. We don't live in, in with extended family networks. We're all sort of in our own pods, even more this generation um, in search of particularly non-college educated um, young people are moving away from their family and social networks in search of uh, lower cost of living. So they're going to places like Nevada and Colorado and uh, Georgia and Texas. So I think what we're seeing, and, and this is not a new phenomenon, I mean, we've been moving away from an extended family of support to you know, each generation in its own household. Um, I, I can't really answer your question. It's just a different economy, a different, you know, getting to college wasn't as important then. It, but there have been it's, critics it's that have been a little... a little too... Yeah. I'm very clear in my book that I'm talking about the post-World War II economy. I'm comparing the modern generations in terms of the ability to get ahead, uh, work and educate your way into the middle class. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to go this way in terms of the questioning, but there have been critics that have been tough, saying, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, gee, you think you have it tough. What about the generation uh, in the Depression and some of the things? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is one of the wealthiest, this is the wealthiest right. country in the world. There are, uh, we're in a, one of the wealthiest states uh, uh, in, the, in the nation. So uh, how, can you, how can you say that it's so difficult to, to get ahead? I mean, you've right. had that kind of criticism. It's funny, though. Um, well, I can answer your question. It's so difficult to get ahead because the wealth is concentrated in, you know, the equivalent of, I don't know how many people are in here, but maybe two people in this room, if we think of our society at large, have all the wealth and the income. And that has, you know, we are at a period of heightened income inequality. And one of the things I talk about is that that impacts our lives. It's changed our political priorities. Um, it's impacting the whether or not you can afford a house in a good school district here in Boston when 
You're competing with people that are making much, much, much more money than you'll ever dream of making. Um, but, you know, something interesting has happened because I want to uh, address the Great Depression. Um, I've been doing a lot of radio where I take call-ins. And I've actually found that young people have become my toughest, toughest critic. Um, the, the, I did this and I'm doing fine. And if everybody else just buckled down and, and did what I did, we wouldn't have this problem. And it's been older people f who lived through the great depression who call in and say, I feel so bad for what's happening to this generation, to my grandkids. I look at what they're facing and I just can't believe what has happened to this country in terms of opportunity and the ability to get ahead. So it's actually starting to be quite the opposite. That's because they want um, you to move out of their houses. Uh, <laughs> so so that's, that's, that's part of it. Get a decent job to take care of the Medicare and uh, Social Security. It's also because grandparents are also picking up a lot of slack. Um, more and more grandparents are helping send their grandkids to college. Yeah. We have a question up front. So we have a, and then one back here. So Eric, if you could give this gentleman a, a handheld, that'd be great. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Um, so what do we, what does our government, what does, do we need to do um, as a whole to work with some of this in the next 10 years um, in a place, especially for Boston, where right now it's $67,000 for a family of four to just make it. Uh, we're spending less and less on uh, higher ed, as you've said, and, and housing is just out of, um, out of reach. What do we do to keep Boston and the Northeast and the rest of the country uh, able to sustain uh, its young population? It's a great question. Um, I can't answer Boston specifically, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the ideas that um, are in the book, the whole last chapter. And then I think more importantly, what all of us as a generation need to be doing to change this obstacle course, not only for ourselves, but for the generation coming up behind us. Um, you know, we know what works. We need to, to fight for um, much more generous access to higher education. We've got to, you know, pressure states to keep funding it and not go, um, you know, when, when they're having good years, put away a rainy day fund instead of lots of tax cuts because then when the market turns, as it always does, um, they turn to things like higher education and health care and, and start slashing away, and that's what we've seen is this very um, unstable commitment to funding really important things like higher education. Um, housing is, is an issue that is not an easy one to solve. One, we have some land scarcity issues. Um, there's lots of incentives now um, because of that for developers to develop the most build the most expensive houses the market will bear in those neighborhoods instead of building moderately sized middle income um, houses. Uh, child there's people care, like me that have a house that I don't want to see the price go down. Right. So I'm I mean, the housing issue, you know, I looked at, um, does everybody know America's first suburb, Levittown in Long Island? Well, back in the 1950s, and, and this is again inflation adjusted, uh, a young family with two kids could buy a house for $52,000 adjusted for inflation, so that's in 2005 dollars. Those houses today are going from 300 to half a million dollars. So the whole idea of a starter home where, where average ordinary people can raise their kids and send them to schools is just gone in a lot of major areas across the country. Well, let's talk about those houses for a second. I mean, they were, they were you know, one bedroom. There was small. Two bedroom. I'm sorry, two bedroom, one bathroom, small kitchen, maybe a small yard. I mean, they were, they were pretty basic, pretty minimum. I mean, uh, the the housing market, you just can't build it. People aren't interested in buying that kind of thing. Really, the condo market is soaring. That's a, that's a and that's a con uh, yeah, but that's a that's a, that's a starter market now I mean, instead when, of the the home. But when people are looking to buy a home, they want something. Um, that's a little bit more grand. How many people here would, if they would jump on the opportunity to buy a two-bedroom, one-bath house that they could extend, they, you could always build on for $52,000? All right, there you go. You made your point. You made your point. Problem is, 
we can't build those, or we won't build those in Massachusetts because, of course, and we worry be, about right. financing um, education, K through 12 education. So we had another question down here, and, and, uh, and then we have one in the back. So Emily has a microphone. Yeah, could you stand up, though, and just give us your name? Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. First of all, we're not the richest country in the world. The Republic of Brunei and Switzerland and many other countries are far richer. Um, but my question is, uh, don't you think that the reason the – could you please don't do it? I'm just trying to be concise and it distracts me from my question. Okay. Thanks. Um, don't you think that the reason the richer kids going to schools is not necessarily as a loan system but because the public school system is so bad – that the only kids who are really prepared for college and who can compete for Ivy Leagues are the kids who either went to private schools or had special tutoring on the side or had summer schools or gifted kids camp mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. It's a really good question. Um, and the being prepared to go on to college is certainly a huge issue. But what's happened is actually, and you may find this hard to believe, we've seen – access decline over the last decade at the same time when actually college prep has increased, particularly among um, low income and uh, students of color. So that's not the only answer. And certainly we need to do a lot better job of preparing um, high school students for college level work and to be honest, high school level students for any work at this point because some of our high schools, the, the quality of education is just so abysmal, you know, they're not prepared for work in general. So that's it, but we can't lose sight that, that there's still other explanations happening because we've actually made progress in uh, preparing kids to do college level work and we've seen declines at the same time. Before we go to the next question, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about uh, the labor market. Yep. Um, because we haven't had a chance to, to get into that. And you describe in your book uh, the labor market for 20- and 30-year-olds consists of the following, bouncers, jugglers, tempsters, and the pajama class. I think we want to become the pajama class, right? <laughs> and it has uh, its benefits. So who are, who are these workers and, and yep. what, what do they do? Describe who, who these people are. Well, the bouncers, and, and nothing sort of provokes the ire of bosses and people in management positions than the fact that this generation just bounces from one job to another and we don't stay long enough at a company. Um, and that's true, and there are reasons for that. One, because that's often the only time that you can get a pay increase because one of the things that has happened um, in the last two decades is the, the sort of middle-level jobs at companies have shrunk. A lot of baby boomers haven't retired as well. Um, but we can't afford to. I know, because you're still supporting your adult children. That's right. <laughs> I have two in college. We're in and this one's, together. One's in the back right now, so my stepdaughter's in the back. This is why the two generations really need to work together. Um, what was my point? Oh, so there's Bounces. less, um, there's, there's less uh, young people are staying in entry-level positions a lot longer than they might have two, three decades ago. So you have to keep moving to try and, and move up the ladder. Um, unfortunately, the benefit of bouncing isn't what it used to be. Uh, compared to previous generations, for each new job you take, you're actually not getting as much of a, a gain in income as you would have two decades ago. Uh, jugglers have become a lot more common. Um, I think the typical, we still think of the typical college student as uh, living on campus, studying full time. That's not the typical college student in America anymore. It's somebody who's working full-time and going to community college, um, taking classes full-time often, and juggling full-time work and full-time studies. And this has become very, very common among this age group. Unfortunately, the paycheck tends to almost always win out over the diploma. And dropout rates at community colleges are um, alarmingly high. Uh, so that's bouncers, jugglers. Tempsters, um, well, I, another big change in the labor market is that companies rely a lot more on temporary and freelance labor, and, and young people are really at the heart of that class. They make up the, the highest percentage of freelance and temporary labor. It's obvious why that is not always a good thing. No benefits, absolutely no job security, because you never know when your next paycheck is going to come, when your next gig is going to come. 
the pajamas, as I like to call them, are sort of a subsection of this temporary labor force. Um, the pajamas are people who work from home, typically in creative industries like writing, graphic design, um, all sorts of other professions where, you know, to, to get an actual writing job at a newspaper is, is they're just rare. Almost all of the articles we read are, are produced through freelance labor. A lot of people love that lifestyle. It has, you know, you can sort of be to work in 30 seconds, climb out of bed, you're, you can start working. Um, but again, trying to buy health care in the private market is, you know, basically like treating yourself to, to two hour long massages every week. That's how expensive it is to actually buy health care on your own. So there's that issue, lack of benefits like 401k plans, retirement plans. So those are sort of the class of workers. Um, Does that describe anybody here today? Do we have any tempsters here and bouncers and, and jugglers? Yeah, we have a and, and so Tempster? Paja yeah, pajama class hopefully will be Photographers, upstairs. Photographers, another creative industry that's so. almost all freelance. But we're told, I mean, I mean, I mean, there, there's an excitement about the creative economy. Sure. There's excitement about that. I mean, this is this is where the future job growth is is supposed to be. But how do you build a career then? How does someone go about, you know, building building a career? I mean, well, it's gotten a lot harder, and I think that's why um, it's not uncommon to to meet people who are on either their sixth or seventh job out of college and still aren't on a career track. I have friends like that. I'm sure some people in this room are in that experience. Um, it's a lot harder. And the job growth um, often doesn't correspond with your innate abilities or interests. Um, unfortunately, the creative industries aren't growing as much as the, the retail sector, the healthcare industry. Um, my career advice to anybody is to become a teacher or a nurse because we have major shortages in those fields. Did you hear that, Wendy? Teacher or nurse? <laughs> and compared to what what uh, you know, compared to what you can make in, in other professions, we should be paying both nurses and teachers more. But it's still a solid middle class job uh, that actually has a level of security that you don't find in uh, in a lot of fields today. The problem is a lot of aspiring teachers can't get through the four years of college necessary um, to become a teacher, and the same goes with nurses. And uh, teachers, of course, uh, pensions and uh, health care, good benefits, mm -hmm. another thing that's disappearing. Great benefits. I had somebody up front that had a question, but there's there's a question in the back. So, Hi, my Hi. name is Swanjiro, and um, I have a question about this debt for a diploma issue. Um, as you pointed out, it's true in this generation, there's such pressure to attend an Ivy League school, especially, I mean, for your bachelor's as well as for your professional degree. And so I'm wondering, um, for those who can't afford to attend an Ivy League, you know, you have to take out loans and you graduate with $100,000 in debt. So I'm wondering, and you know, I also hear um, someone like Susie Orman always saying, Student loan debt is the best debt you can ever have because it takes you somewhere. So I'm curious to know what your take is on that, and does graduating with $100,000 plus in student loans from an Ivy League um, ensure you, from your research, I don't know if you've been if you've come across this, ensure you ensure that you get a job that helps you cancel out that debt, or do you find that, as you said, debt begets more debt? Really good question. Um, in terms of the bang for the buck, like the benefits of going to a private college, in terms of earnings that you get after, there's differing studies on that. Some show a pretty sizable difference, but others don't show a big difference at all. The benefit of going to a private university like a Yale or a Harvard or other select institutions um, are the connections you make, the social capital that you're buying, um, which I wholeheartedly don't think should cost $100,000 in student loans that you'll be paying off until you're 50. Um, I disagree with this idea that student loan, I mean, compared to credit card debt, sure, student loan debt is, is better, and it is true. It's an investment in your future. At the same time, um, it is a major drag on the economic security of young people and is really making it much, much more difficult for them to get ahead in their 20s and early 30s. And now more than ever, there's pressures not only to get the bachelor's degree, but 
so many occupations now require that you go on and get a master's degree, um, which almost all people finance through, through loans. So I think we have to, to absolutely push back against this idea of, well, student loan debt's okay because, you know, you're investing in your future. Um, well, we used to invest in people's future by all of us chipping in instead of every person having to invest on their, their future on their own. And guess what? We did a lot better job of getting people in and out of college when we all chipped in and paid for it together than we, than we do now. I think that's an, that's an interesting point, but I, I sometimes wonder if, if uh, you know, what we have now is really what, what, what we wanted. I mean, uh, we have um, a labor market. Uh, we, we certainly we have a global economy now. Uh, many economists and politicians say that globalization is good for the economy. Um, we have uh, a society in the 1980s where you know, the, the catchword was, uh, the phrase was greed is good uh, and this is the way you're going to be successful. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, organized labor, and I, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but organized labor was an important force in helping to develop and sustain the middle class uh, there in retreat. Uh, but, it, you know, isn't this what we wanted? Isn't, I mean, we created this. We didn't create it. <laughs> um, I think that's what some people wanted. I mean, I think the, the underlying point here is that this was a really concerted effort to, to make all the benefits go to the people who were creating the system that had the benefits to begin with. But I want to touch on two points that you made about um, organized labor. Organized labor is in retreat because we've had a rash of state laws that make it incredibly difficult for workers who want to organize to do so. We've also completely uh, dropped the ball in terms of the, the watchdogs that are supposed to be enforcing um, workers' rights to organize. In fact, um, you know, if you ask workers who aren't in a union if they are interested in joining one, over half of them say yes, because people get that unions give you more paychecks, more security, better benefits. And there's a reason why Walmart, our nation's largest employer, is not unionized. And it's not because that's what the workers want. That's because that's what Walmart wants and the stockholders of Walmart want because they know if they get unionized, they're all of a sudden going to have to pay higher wages, health care benefits, and things like that. But the customers of Walmart want that too, though, because that, right. that also is going to mean higher prices. I mean, it's a vicious Walmart cycle. says... Someone at Walmart says, you know, we've, we give America a pay raise because we keep our prices down. Well, here's the thing. America wouldn't need a pay raise through Walmart if we had a higher national minimum wage, if people could join a, a union when they want to at, at their jobs. And I think unions are definitely much more important for this, the, the lower level of the, the retail services, home health care, aids, those type of professions. Um, because what's happened is we've lost the high-paying blue-collar jobs that were great for people that didn't have college degrees, um, were unionized, and they've been replaced with jobs like Walmart and home health care aides. So we wouldn't be so reliant on saving a dollar on a 12-pack of Charmin toilet paper if we were actually earning more money and asking corporations to do their part. Other questions? We have a question from the audience. Yes, uh, sir, right in the middle here. If you could stand up, yeah, with the turtleneck and... Uh, Turnix, collar, jeez. Oh. <laughs> I realized that after I said that, that it's a collar. That's not. Nice. That's so, really funny. Uh, <laughs> as a Unitarian Universalist, I just accept my apology. Take absolve him. My name is Patrick Gray, and I'm an Episcopal priest at the Church of the Advent over on um, Beacon Hill. And uh, one of the exciting things at the Advent is um, um, a third of our congregation rapidly approaching a half of our, our regular Sunday attendance is under 40. Um, the, uh, the, uh, it worries me, though, because I can't keep them. Um, uh, the, I have a bunch of leaders that I uh, want to make a difference uh, in their communities, and they can't afford to stay in their communities. And you're mentioning uh, unions, and I guess I'm thinking of uh, folks like me in the third sector, uh, areas like churches and synagogues and uh, CDCs and so forth. Um, I do a lot of work with the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. One of the exciting things you know, that's going on right now is the health care reform, uh, waiting for the committee to report out. Uh, from the state house, um, but I guess you know, and I hadn't read your book, so uh, 
it sounds like your last chapter you're offering some constructive uh, 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 possibilities. Um, but also, uh, you'd hinted there's been this shift to personal responsibility uh, within our, the life of our government, within the life of our culture. Um, uh, and I lament that because it seems also that there's been this lack of, of relationality, a lack of sociality, uh, the lack that we do uh, depend on each other um, and that um, uh, we can get more if we work together. Um, and so I don't know exactly what my question is. I guess you know, I want you to help me keep my young people around. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, is it time for us to think like uh, three single people who uh, you know, are not going to marry anytime soon going on a house together? How do we do that mm -hmm. um, so that they can mm -hmm. get their foot in the door and start building equity? Because mm -hmm. what other equity do we have? Right. Um, do you have examples like that? Do you have stories like that to tell uh, that, mm -hmm. to help a, a priests like me who are worried? <laughs> Your points are all very well taken. Um, I mean, you bring up a lot of issues. The, the one I wanted to address, though, is you mentioned the, um, the shift to the individual, and, and the third sector has also been um, asked to take on much more of the burden for a lot of these things than they used to. And to me, the important thing to keep in mind, it's not that I think government should do everything, but what we've lost sight of is that government has powers that, through all of us who make up government, it can accomplish things that the, the philanthropic and, and public sector, or I'm sorry, um, nonprofit sector, couldn't even come close to accomplishing um, in terms of the power of its resources that it has to, to levy against things like higher education, uh, building homes that are affordable. Um, in the book, you know, I have a whole chapter of reforms. I think the, the thing we can do if, if let's accept let's say, that we have a real deep structural issue, even if we bring back unions. The, the fact of the matter is, is that we still have incomes and costs that are way out of whack. And getting the income problem solved is probably politically going to be much more difficult than solving the cost issue, which is subsidizing higher education, subsidizing things like child care, providing more tax credits through the tax code so that people can save up a down payment to get into a home. Um, as for the trend of a bunch of single people going in into a home, I don't know what the numbers are, but I do know that that is actually that is happening. Um, but uh, there is a lot of risk with that as well. <laughs> I, so. I, I want to get into your agenda uh, for a moment because you lay out a rather detailed. Uh, and I give you a lot of credit for doing this. I'm a wonk at heart. Yeah. Well, you don't just uh, kind of describe the the challenges and document that. You also say, um, here are some things that we can do to solve some of these problems. And you also challenge uh, 20, 30-year-olds about their lack of political participation. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you lay out a four-part plan. Uh, education is the cornerstone of social mobility. Work should be rewarded. Everyone should have a stake in society. And family life should come first. Why don't you get, give us a little bit of the details of, of what you're talking about with that four-part plan. Okay. Well, education as the sort of cornerstone of, of social mobility, the United States has always really relied on its educational system to be the prime engine of moving up the, echo, the socioeconomic ladder. So when, when we're not investing in that, we see a breakdown in mobility, and indeed that's what's happened. It has gotten much harder in the last uh, two, three decades to go from the bottom end of the income spectrum to the middle and from the middle to the top. Um, so what I talk about is the need to switch back to get this balance uh, back to we have more grants, particularly for people from low to middle income households and less loans. I absolutely don't say nobody should have to take out a loan. I don't think that's realistic. But we need to get the balance um, a little bit more tilted back to the grant side of things so that people aren't leaving school with twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in debt. Um, work should pay. Uh, I talk about the need to uh, make the legal right of being able to organize your workplace a, a reality, which it just is no longer. Um, and without going into the details, this is something I actually didn't know a lot about until I read the book. Um, and I come from a union family and went through this sort of anti-union period in my life where I thought that they were too outdated for the new economy. 
you've all probably heard that. And after really looking at the research, uh, I've totally come around to the idea that without more unions in the private sector, particularly in the lower end of the healthcare industry, the retail industry, um, we are not going to get um, the economic security that we once had in this country because unions were so important to building the middle class. What's the other one? Stake in society. Um, one of the things I also uncovered when I wrote this book, you know, we give, the tax code can be great for creating incentives for people to do things that you want them to do or people, or um, stopping pe people from doing things you don't want them to do. But right now, some of the incentives that we're, we offer in the tax code are just out of whack with, with I think, what the, the common mainstream values of most Americans. And let me give you an example. In our tax code, we provide more tax benefits to somebody who buys a second home than we do to somebody who has a second child that they're trying to raise. And there are all sorts of things that we can do to correct that. We also spend or forgo about $330 billion every year in tax credits and tax deferred savings that uh, rarely reach young people and um, never reach low income people. So we can rejigger some of the tax incentives so that, let's say, when you get out of college, if you have student loan debts, we say, you know what, we're going to give you a year to not even bother paying those back. In the meantime, for every dollar you put into a savings account, we're going to give you a tax credit at the end of the year. Maybe it's a quarter, maybe it's 50 cents, maybe it's a dollar. Think big. It could be a dollar. But there are lots of things we can do to help make, uh, ensure that young people are on a path to ownership um, from the very beginning. But, I mean, you're you, you make a real bold uh, statement in your book or plan. Um, you talk about reforming the, the home mortgage deduction, yes, the in, interest deduction. I mean, that is a uh, third rail, I think, uh, in terms of politics. Yeah. Um, you know, the Bush administra uh, administration's tax commission actually um, pretty much laid out a plan <laughs> just like mine, and I about passed out. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the mortgage deduction has just become this thing that has just drifted so far from what it was intended to do. And the reality is there's no limit on the amount of interest that you can deduct through the tax code. That's the mortgage interest deduction. So you have people who are in multi-million dollar homes deducting thousands and thousands of dollars of interest um, on their home, which basically means they're, they're paying less uh, taxes. Um, Instead, we should be using limit that, you know, maybe you can only deduct $10,000 of interest from your mortgage every year. That way, everybody that's going to still, uh, anybody who's in the middle class, anybody who's lower income, they're still going to get the mortgage tax benefit, but we're going to do things in a way that makes sense. And what we do with the saved money is we invest in things like these matched savings accounts I was talking about, or we invest in things like uh, providing real dollars to a child care system so that parents can afford the best uh, child care um, available. We had another question, I think, in the back. Uh, way in the back, was there somebody who had a question, Em? Yes, go ahead. Just uh, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi. So the question I have is all of the ideas you're laying out are really kind of grand scheme and hopefully will be great for our kids. But so what do we do now, those of us who are graduating with $100,000 in debt and can't pay a living wage and are trying to figure out what to do, what do we do besides vote and bug our politicians and all of that? Tough question. Um, well, I don't know how many people in here have kids, so creating a child care system and paid family leave is probably something that will benefit you all in a short number of years and benefit you greatly financially. Um, there are lots of things that we could do in, in terms of student loan debt forgiveness, for example. Um, I don't have this in the book, and I wish I would have put it in there for that very reason. You know, if, if you have student loan debt that is X percentage higher than the, the median income in your occupation, we're going to forgive that whatever amount that's over. Um, you know, there are lots of ways that we could come up with something but don't discount the voting thing because I don't know how many people in here vote regularly, but unfortunately our generation um, has really dropped the ball in terms of flexing their political muscle. 
And one of the things I, I really talk about is the need to try and engage this generation. And it's not all our fault. I mean, politicians haven't really been talking to us or offering us anything that sounds remotely like it is going to impact our lives. Um, at the same time, they don't talk to us or offer us any goodies because we don't show up on election day and we don't fill their email inboxes with outraged letters when they vote uh, like they just did to make student loans more expensive. Um, they just did that this week. So we have got to really ramp up the, uh, the political participation. I mean, you're tough on this generation in your book, and I give you credit for that as well in terms of the disinterest in politics and civic life, of people not reading newspapers or really following civic events. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Mass Inc. started this program was to try to have these kinds of conversations uh, about civic issues taking place. You know, I, d I didn't hear any of what you're talking about in the President's State of the, State of, uh, State of the Union address Tuesday night. Right. Well, there's just... Um, not only for young people, but I think in general right now, we have this growing gap between sort of what Congress is working on and what is actually keeping people awake at night. Um, and we've always had this gap where what's impacting young people is, seems to hardly ever be at the top of the political agenda. So I do. I actually, this is one area in the book where I actually am a little heavy on the finger wagging. Um, I actually, and it's old fashioned, but I, I challenge people who read the book if they are not currently reading a major national newspaper every day to do so for a month, and I will guarantee them that something will really piss them off or excite them, and then that's all it takes. And, you know, we live in the era of the Internet. It has never been I know that last Red Sox easier. trade uh, was really. <laughs> Social issues that really ignite your passion or, or piss you off. Um, uh, we, we just aren't taking advantage of the Internet. It is so easy now to be politically active. You, there's all types of organizations. There are organizations involved in the student loan debt battles. There are organizations pushing for universal child care and paid family leave in this country. All you have to do, visit their website, put your email in. When something's happening in your state or at the federal level, they'll let you know. You send them an email. It takes, I'm not kidding, 30 seconds to make an impact um, in your Congress member's office because I can tell you how many emails are in their inbox make a huge difference. It tells them you're paying attention. It tells them that they've got support to vote a certain way. Um, and they're not getting any emails from this generation. So I, I really encourage people. I think knowledge is the first step. You can't really fight against what you're not aware is happening in the first place. Um, and the, the percentage of people that actually read the newspaper, either online or in print, is, is embarrassingly low. It's embarrassing. We have a question right up front. Eric? Hi, my name is Darcy. Oh, hi. Um, hi. I haven't read your book either, but I was wondering, um, in terms of labor market concerns and the tempsters issue, I, I mean, I've heard business leaders talk about the increasing cost of health care as one reason they won't take on additional employees. Um, what do you think about, you know, President Bush's health savings accounts proposal or portable savings accounts, or what, what do you think we should be doing as a nation mm -hmm. to address that issue? I think we, that's a great question. Um, I think we need to move toward universal health care, and there are lots of different ways to do it. Health savings accounts are not going to get us there because the cost of health insurance is just what, what's being offered is a drop in the bucket in terms of what it actually costs a family to buy health insurance in the open market. Um, there are lots of ways we could go about universal health care, um, and the, the most important thing is we just need to do it. And I think that what's happening to the cost in terms of businesses may finally be the straw that breaks the camel's back um, because it, it's getting a lot of attention that it wasn't previously. And if it's bad for business, that may actually be something that finally ignites this debate again. There is some momentum around the health care issue again. I mean, we've been there. We were there before. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is now sort of round two. I mean, right now in Massachusetts, there are plans that are being discussed. In fact, the governor uh, requires uh, everyone a mandatory um, health care plan. Everyone mm -hmm. has, like, like auto insurance. Yep. There's been a lot of resistance to that, or there's been some resistance to that from, from younger people in terms of uh, being able to afford that and the kind of 
benefits and, and that are being uh, um, offered. I, I think one of the one of the challenges that we have in, in, in a place where we need to make change. I mean, the healthcare system in this country uh, it has been so attached to your employment, right? And we've got to figure out how to sort of move beyond that. Absolutely. So, other questions? Yes. Sorry, you're you're in a great spot. We're gonna we're gonna have two of our staff try to reach you, so you can speak in stereo. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Catherine, and I actually bought a house in Chelsea two years ago. And I heard you say a couple of times when you're talking about housing, I want to live in a good neighborhood, buy a home in a good neighborhood with good school systems for my, to raise my child in. I took the opposite approach. I chose a neighborhood that I could afford. That although I don't have children, I'm thinking that if more people would move into these neighborhoods, it might help so that these are going to be good school systems. Is there enough push for young people to say, I don't need to live in Newton. I can live in what is now maybe considered not the greatest neighborhood and change the fact that my car has been broken into four times by being active. I'm not really hearing that. I'm hearing you say, I want to live somewhere nice. What about those of us who are saying, I want to make where I'm living nice? I mean, how do you change that? Urban pioneer, very interesting. That's a great idea. Um, the flip side is you just priced out everybody who lived in that that market to begin with and whose kids grew up in that neighborhood and won't be able to buy the homes because that's what happens. That's gentrification. There are ways to do it without that happening. Um, the problem is, I think what I'm talking about is usually when people move into home ownership, the trigger for that is they're starting a family and they are looking for things like safety, good schools, those kinds of things. So I applaud you. I think you're exactly right. Um, but I'm a policy person, so. But I mean, I think, I think what you're saying, and, and this is actually something that Mass Inc. is, is looking at, is. You know, is there a way of making some of our uh, industrial cities, our mill cities, more attractive uh, to families, to immigrant families as well, that are also uh, dealing with the high cost of housing? And I, I think it's an interesting issue. I don't live on Admiral Hill either. Okay. And are the schools good there? They're getting better. That's great. Um, they're not great, but I, I always vote. And, hopefully you know, we'll and don't you stop. <laughs> no, I applaud you. Seriously, it's just not my, not no, my I mean, arena. It, I mean, when it comes down to the schools, I mean, that is a, that is a very uh, important issue in terms of choosing the kind of community that you're going to live in. My story is kind of similar. We, we bought our house in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, again, a community that was on the rise. But we've really sweated out, out the schools. And in fact, my youngest daughter is now in a charter school. So, you know, that's how we solve that particular problem for ourselves. So, um, you know, but I do think there's some opportunities with some of these communities. Uh, and if you look at the most recent issue of Commonwealth Magazine, there's a good piece in there about what's going on in Worcester and in Lowell around the housing front. So we have time for a couple of more questions. Why don't we go in the back? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, um, I just had a two-part question. Um, at the beginning, you gave a statistic, I think 70% don't get a college degree. Is that right? A bachelor's degree. A bachelor's degree. And yep. I know before you are talking about how today the bachelor's degree is the old high school diploma, so it seems like everyone is going. I don't know if there's a lot of people not graduating. And the second piece was about the labor idea. You know, I think the idea about the unions, today you can pick up a phone, call a 1-800 number and you're talking to somebody in India, I think <clears throat> isn't the reality is that as the world gets more global and we have to compete, you know, the auto makers are having issues because their costs are just far higher mm -hmm. than what they have to compete with even here. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's a little um, not too realistic in some ways to think that unions today are doing in the same field that they were before when we had a lot more barriers to entry. A couple of things about that. Um, the, the two fields that are going to have both the fastest and largest job growth over the next 10 years, two fields out of the 10, um, are the healthcare services professions at the, the lower end, the sort of nursing end, and um, retail sector, and um, I just lost my train of thought, home health care aides. None of these jobs can be shipped to India. They can't be outsourced. Somebody has to empty the bedpans 
of old people, and that job is going to become even more important as the biggest generation starts to retire. Same goes with lots of service sector jobs. Somebody's got to be at the, the counter to check you out um, when you buy your groceries or when you go to Walmart. So those jobs aren't going anywhere, which is why I think unions are so critical today, because we've got to make those jobs good jobs, and, and unions can do that. Um, the, to clarify the, the college-going stuff, about 30% of 25- of to 34-year-olds have bachelor's degrees. Now, about 70, almost three-quarters of high school graduates go on to some type of college. So that includes trade schools, community colleges, uh, four-year colleges. They're, the dropout rates are about 40% of entering freshmen drop out their second year. Um, and the rates at community college, the dropout rates are, are much, much higher. So that's why there's such a difference between how many people are actually getting into the system and how many people are finishing. It is a real problem that I don't think people are as aware of. So let me take one more uh, question for Tammy, and then I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, ask the final question. So yes, and here comes Emily. Emily doesn't have to go to the gym tonight. Um, I guess my question sort of addresses the personal responsibility thing that you had mentioned. I think that young people now have to sort of be their own experts about everything. I mean, if you look at something like TurboTax, you just go click, 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 click. And are we losing out by choosing those options because we're not getting the kind of uh, advice and education, um, I don't know, to get ourselves ahead? And is that something that we could do to sort of address your question right now? Um, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tricky question because it, what it reminds me of is, is um, at Demos to do a lot of work on credit card debt. And one of the first responses is always, well, we just need better financial education and then people won't go into debt. And I always say we're not going to educate our way out of this problem. Um, there are lots of smart people that have lots of credit card debt. Um, what I talk about, though, is the financial sophistication that is now required for the things you talked about is definitely lacking. Um, you know, that's across the board. I mean, that's not absolutely. Good. I mean, yeah, it's across the board. But what can help you? You know, get a subscription to Money Magazine or, or buy a, a nuts and bolts guide to, to investing and saving. Um, I always like those idiots guides. Uh, idiots guides. Me. That's something you could do right away. Um, I recommend uh, Susie Orman's book because I think it's it's at a level that many finance books aren't. It's really accessible and really realistic about what is achievable during this stage of life. Um, it's called The Money Book for the Young, Fabulous, and Broke. <laughs> and so if you're fabulous and broke, buy a copy after you buy my copy of Strap Tonight. That's good. And, but don't charge it. So, <laughs> Tammy, it's uh, terrific having you here. This has been a great conversation. We're going to have a chance to continue... Uh, uh, this talk uh, at a reception afterwards. Uh, I want to take a moment before I ask the closing question just to thank the Mass Inc. staff for all their work in putting this together. This is uh, not an easy thing to do. I also want to thank our, t our friends at uh, the one in, 1 in 3 Boston for their work and support. If you don't know about One in Three Boston, it's a, it's a great way to get more involved in uh, uh, civic life here in the city, and there's some information about that program here tonight. Uh, and I also want to thank Demos for having the opportunity to bring Tammy here and to have this uh, terrific conversation. So the last question uh, before we uh, break for our reception, Tammy, is where do we go from here? What's next? Buy the book. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I think what's next is what I hope, and let me tell you a little bit about what I'm doing over the next couple weeks and, and why it's great that I wrote a book and I'm connected to an organization like Demos. Because um, one of the things I really want to try and make happen is to meet more organizations like One in Three, like Mass Inc. all across the country. Um, I'm going to be doing lots of meetings on the Hill um, in Washington. For, on the Hill, sorry, that's I'll be going to Congress um, and getting this stuff in front of their faces and saying, you know, 
These are real issues here. This is a political issue that is winnable for you that could really turn out a lot of voters for you in the 06 and the 08 elections. Um, I'm going to be working with groups like Rock the Vote to, to bring more of an economic agenda rather than just uh, get out the vote efforts because those sort of come up during election cycles and then they sort of go away until the next presidential election. I mean, I think young people today need uh, AARP for them, you know, so that we can really uh, organize and flex our political muzzle. And I think that's what we need to do. Have conversations with your neighbors. Um, you know, I'm thrilled to have somebody who um, is here from the faith community because I think a lot of this stuff happens. Um, you know, we need to start meeting people where they're at and figuring out a way, a really simple way to um, get stuff done. And uh, it's going to take a long time. I, you know, we can't be Pollyannish about it, but we also can't give up. And uh, if I accomplish anything tonight, I hope it's to inspire you to become maybe a little bit more politically engaged than you are and to also have a little bit more hope. Because one of the things I think that this generation suffers from is it has just, we've just gotten paralyzed by this idea that it's all our fault. All we hear is the lectures and the finger wagging about the Starbucks lattes. Um, and it, it just completely disempowers and paralyzes our ability to think that maybe, hey, we could change the system. And we've got to believe that, that we can because previous generation, this country would be a much worse off place if every generation thought like we are currently thinking that we can't change the system. So I think that is the most important thing um, in terms of where we go from here. Tammy, thank you very much. <laughs>